All right, it's intro time. And we go a little something like this. Hit it. Larry, I'm going to start with you this week. All right. On Tuesday night, Larry Schultz watched with eager anticipation as the president he defends addressed our divided nation. Old Joe went after the GOP like a quarterback dropping dimes, and he rarely lost his place and mostly remembered his lines. Joe toyed with his detractors and in the end didn't look spent. But did anybody see it? Compared to last year, his ratings were down 28%. No comeback, Larry. No, it's great. (laughs) (laughs) He's a former libertarian, and now I know why. After my exposure to their most active harm and hating guy, he's gone independent because he has seen the light. But that doesn't mean David Valente won't fight. So where was that passion and where was that pep when all those angry libertarians showed up on my doorstep? Mr. Valente. I I apologize for that. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Apology accepted. He's the president of the Republican Club in Berkeley County, which means he has to clean up messes even more than bounty. The latest one is this tax disagreement between Householder and Blair. Can I get those two together to come up with a solution that's fair? You can call this guy a lot of things, like the quicker picker-upper. Just make sure you don't call Alonzo Perry late for supper. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. Chris, I got two choices for you. I got a... <laughs> That's scary. I got a, <laughs> I'm officially terrified now. I got a power tool option and a Biden option. Which one would you like? Oh, you pick one. I'll let you run with it. Let's go with power tools. <laughs> you want to go power tools? <laughs> I like them better than Biden, obviously. <laughs> If a tree falls in your yard, does it make a noise? It does if it's big enough and you need to call in your boys. So call him and I did, and I called him in good. And moments later, he arrived with power tools that cut wood. They say a friend in need is a friend indeed. But be careful not to abuse it, because Chris Anders has the biggest chainsaw, and he's not afraid to use it. That's right. That's right. <laughs> we'll save you Biden one for another day. It sounds wonderful. Each and every week, he's always the leadoff hitter. And he's got a conspiracy theory right up there with Seinfeld's second spitter. You remember that episode with Keith Hernandez, the Met, when Newman and Kramer claimed his magic loogie made them wet? Well, that theory was disproved when Hernandez blamed teammate Roger McDowell. Joe Ferretti will soon attempt to prove his own conspiracy theory. And I can't wait to see how. (laughs) I appreciate the setup, Rob. And on that setup, Joe... Boom, you're on. All right. Well, I'm going to take about two minutes to to explain it. But to me, it just kind of jumps out as something that I think is is, uh, quite possible in in what's going on in our Senate in Charleston. Now, setting it up, we know there's no love lost between Senator Eric Tarr, chairman of finance in the Senate, and the governor. So last week, when everybody in the state was clamoring for the Senate tax plan, and presumably the Senate was working on it day and night, what does the Senate Finance Committee do last Friday? They have a meeting regarding the governor's much-publicized repurposing of the CARES Act money, sending that to a governor's discretionary fund where he hands out gifts, and they examine his, the governor's giving of $10 million to his alma mater, Marshall University, for a new baseball field. After that Friday Senate Finance Committee meeting, then Senator Tarr and others run out to the media and want to talk about it. And in those interviews, you actually hear the word impeachment being kicked around. Now, let me state this clearly, Rob. I have no confirmation of this, but I state this as my opinion and as based on conjecture. But I think it's well-founded. I believe the Senate timed that meeting last Friday to take place just in advance of them rolling out their tax plan to leverage that situation and send a message to our governor they, they, they will not stand for any more torpedoes of their legislative initiatives like the governor did, remember, with Amendment 2, and like he was doing barnstorming around the state again, touting the House plan to cut income taxes by 50%. They didn't like it. They took it as a personal offense, 
and now they want to leverage this situation with Marshall University to send a message to our governor who hopes to run for a U.S. Senate seat that unless he wants an investigation in the background, he better play ball with them on the Senate tax plan. And as soon as that tax plan was released by the Senate, the governor took to the microphone and was jubilant and praising the Senate, praising Craig Blair and thanking them for sending him this plan. I think that situation just, to me, it is a red flag that there is something going on behind the scenes where the Senate is sending this clear message to the governor, play ball and not at Marshall University. So my, my question this morning is, am I on to something or am I off my meds? <laughs> All right, let me channel my inner uh, Joe Pesci and my cousin Vinny as attorney Vincent Gambini. Does the defense's case hold water? Larry Schultz. Well, there's a couple of questions that I don't know the answer to that might clarify this a little bit. How long ago did the $10 million uh, dollar, uh, expenditure to Marshall, uh, how long ago did that happen? It was pretty recent, Joe, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. I think when, within the past uh, month or two at the most. Okay. And, and on the day that it happened, we didn't hear a word out of Senator Tarr, did we? Not that I know of. No. And, no, of he, course, he knew then that it was CARES Act money and that if it's wrong, it was wrong back then. So I think that fact that there was a delay in bringing it up kind of suggests, I mean, uh, that maybe – uh, they were waiting around for the right moment to use it, which sort of suggests that you're on to something, Joe. So the defense's case does hold water. Oh, yeah. Oh, my. Mr. Valente. I've got several thoughts on this. Um, uh, first off, my alumni association better not get any ideas about me give, or giving them $10 million for a baseball <laughs> season. They'll um, settle for I am, I am not Brett Favre. You know? <laughs> I'm not going to take public money and go for a, a public public expenditure like that um uh, you know i i i think this does hold a lot of water this does you know constitute a shot across the bow of, of governor justice to say you know what back off of you know pushing against the senate plan um but it, it's still they still have to work through the the house uh, with with what they're going to do with the the uh, tax cuts um and i still feel like it's going to be end up being like lucy with the football as far as tax cuts go we're going to get down to the end and the ball is going to get taken away and we're going to continue just spending the the surplus money that we have um but uh yeah for me i think it is uh, there there is some fire to this um that taking this cares act money and giving it to a university for a baseball stadium seems to be an abuse of what the cares act was supposed to do so um you know i'm i'm okay with them them investigating this stuff and running it to ground and if it is an impeachable offense let's do it i believe joe correct me if i'm long, wrong i believe that this was vetted through berkeley bentley the attorney uh, down there the governor was uh, getting counsel from on this Yes, correct. Uh, and also his uh, the law firm, the Bailey firm uh, out of Charleston, I believe, uh, that the governor's office often consults with. Governor spokesman uh, was quick to point out that they had received legal opinions that the repurposing of this CARES Act money, uh, which the governor characterized as a uh, basically a refund to the state of other expenditures we made during covid uh, that that was a, an appropriate uh, appropriation to make for uh, Marshall University because it was discretionary funds that really belonged to the state. But I don't think that the governor really surrounds himself with a lot of no men. <laughs> so, I mean, he may have got his opinion, but it's the opinion that he wanted. So. Is that a job, by the way? Can a you, no man? Can you apply for a no I, man I, job? I, oh, yeah. I've had somebody a who's, a, who's, a, who's a libertarian lives as a professional no man. So, usually the, you know. the no man job usually is the guy in charge of me when I ask for a raise. No man. No man. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Anders. Well, I mean, let's look at this. It, 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 it would be extremely hilarious if it wasn't so absolutely disgusting. Because whenever government spends money, that's a tax on the people, right? 
And, you know, we're, we're fighting, they're posturing with each other. They're fighting over, is this going to be Blair's plan? Or is it going to be Hanshaw's plan? Or the governor, whichever one they're backing at this moment. In the end, it's the people's money. Give them their, their damn money back. Okay, let's let's start there. They're not they're using this as a as a tool to posture themselves for higher office, which is what politicians do. It's all political theater. They're tossing this back and forth. You know, in the end, they work for us. It is our money. You know, they need to get their heads straight and realize that or we the people are going to have to fire them. By the way, when you said they needed to get their heads, I was hoping you weren't going with the other half of that sentence. <laughs> well, you know, I, I do agree with that. <laughs> appreciate, appreciate your editing there. But what about Mr. Ferretti's uh, theory here? I mean, yeah, I, I, he's probably he's probably right. I mean, you know, again, it's all posturing. You know, you can schedule meetings. I watch these all over the republic, you know, I, you know working in different states. They move meetings. They change meetings. They do stuff to time things. It's all political theater. And, and it's a fight over power. Power over what? Power over us. So they need to start realizing they do work for us. And they need to get their heads together together okay and uh and they need to work together to get us our money back it's not theirs used as a political football mr perry i don't see this as some like framing of or i i think that joe ferretti's uh yeah, I think it's a mischaracterization of what's actually happening here, and we can't frame it as power politics. You know, this is uh, Governor Justice trying to buy his election, and I think that that's you know evident. I think that he can you know sway a large ma majority of that area by saying you know oh look look what I've done for you you know um, with this purchase. But at the same time, our jails are filled with National Guardsmen. You know, so to take this money and to use it for a pet project is just wholeheartedly irresponsible. It has nothing to do with the Senate's tax plan. You know, uh, this is uh, our elected officials doing something that's inappropriate. And, you know, I, I, you know, applaud the Senate for bringing it to the forefront. I don't think that this has anything to do with their plan. I think that it's just saying, wow, this is pretty low, you know, and uh, I, I think it's discouraging. But um, so no, you, I don't think there's a conspiracy. You say TAR's movement is simply that of a concerned finance chairman investigating money he feels was wrongly appropriated. I think that, you know, we're addressing something that should be addressed. Why are we spending uh, CARES money when we have a million other projects that we could be spending that money so on? So no conspiracy whatsoever, Alonzo. No conspiracy Then why whatsoever. didn't he object on the day that the grant was made to Marshall? I think that, you know, you have to realize that you can't just preemptively accuse someone of something. You have to say Freddie just and, did. He and, just did it yeah. about 10 minutes ago. <laughs> See? And that's, that's And I've know, got it on tape. That's, well, that's, was, his implication was reasonable people can't do that. You know, you, you have to... <laughs> Yeah. The fact that people do. <laughs> so. You know, you have to afford people the benefit of the doubt. And when you first see something, you know, you have to look into it further. You can't just sit there and say, oh, you know, this is what this was for. I'm sure after, you know, uh, they started to look at the numbers as things started to appear when they started looking at into the actual CARES funding. I mean, we can't expect, you know, a, a finance chair to know every other moving piece, you know, happening at, at once. And I think that, you know, under a further uh, investigation he found this and was like wow this is you know uh, something that I feel like people need to hear about and uh, I, I applaud him for that so Joe the way I cipher this up here is I've got two yes votes for the defense's case holds water one no and Anders, I have to admit, I don't know what his answer was. I was just relieved he was saying people weren't pulling their heads out of their arses. So at that point, I lost the count on what Anders' vote was. I, don't, I still don't know what, where he sits. I would put it as a yes. All right, thank you. So it's, it's a 3-1 vote in your favor here, Joe. Well, I, I, look, I agree with Alonzo that, that the actual act of repurposing this money uh, should be questioned. And because it, I think it's clear this money was originally earmarked for the jails in West Virginia. So, you know, we have that issue. But I, I'm not so much focusing on the proprietary, pri the propriety of the act itself. I'm looking at the po power politics that are in play in the Senate. And I'm, I'm going to rest my case on this point. My last question to Craig Blair this morning was, is this a serious investigation in the Senate? And his answer was, oh, yes, it is. And then he went and mentioned the governor's run for Senate. He made the linkage. I rest my case. <laughs> if, if Governor Justice comes out and all of a sudden is, is 
gunning down this Senate plan, I mean, you, I would say you are absolutely right. But I don't think that that's going to happen. I think that uh, he was excited to see their plan and probably had Jubilee because he wanted to pick it apart for what it is. And I think that it's, you know, uh, a, a detraction from the House plan that I think most West Virginians support. Now, Jeff Haddock's Joe has a conspiracy theory part two here where he's asking, does anybody know if Tar and Mooney are Tar and Blair are Mooney men? That could be the motive. So in other words, we throw some mud at the governor. That helps Mooney's case running for Senate. So there was a conspiracy sequel going on there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, could be. I, and I don't know the answer to that question. The idea that $10 million gets spent on a baseball stadium that could have, and, and arguably from the language of the grant, should have been spent on the jails that are full of National Guardsmen who did not join the U.S. military in order to serve as convict watchers. That's not why they went in, and that's not what their purpose is in being National Guard members. I always wonder uh, the great job that the National Guard did back during the floods in the middle of the state. What happens if we have those floods again? They're going to pull them out of the jails? Who's going to take care of the jails? <laughs> yeah. No, it's, we don't need a baseball team at Marshall at all if that's what it comes down to. Um, and, and, you know, this money could also be used to hire CPS workers. <laughs> and they're not doing that either. I, I would what say about CPS it, workers who play baseball? Yeah. You thought about <laughs> yeah, the oh, purposing of the money. <laughs> you know, and there I put in, you know, put in the statement that it's not the government's job to fund sports teams and sports stadiums. Although, although it has become oh, yeah. that. Oh, it, it has. Yeah. Unfortunately, and our founding Pro fathers would be everywhere. rolling around in their graves if they realized what we're letting them get away with. That's not the job of government. I, I, I would uh, concur we should not be using the tax dollars to build stadiums for, for people to play in it. Yeah. Uh, that irritates me. Um, to the, to the, the broader picture of the tax plans, though, and the competing tax plans, right? You, you have the, the House plan, which still sits based on a 50% personal income tax cut, which has a much larger uh, price tag to it, twice what the Senate's version is as it came back as a $600 million bill from the Senate. What are your thoughts on the competing tax plans, David? Let me go to you first. Well, uh, like I said earlier, I think this uh, tax cuts in West Virginia are going to continue to be like Lucy holding the football. That it's She's going to put it down. We're going to run up and go, yeah, we're going to get tax cuts. And it's going to get pulled out at the last minute. And it, You're and thinking you get nothing by the end of I, this session. Yeah, I don't think that the House and the Senate are going to work. To, I mean, you hear Craig talking about it. There was a, really is not a whole lot of communication <laughs> between the House and the Senate talking about this. Yet. You would, yet. But past performance is indicative of future performance. But now so. that they're putting the squeeze on the governor from Ferretti's conspiracy plan, the House and the Senate could get together. They could. I, I still think that the, the House is going to toe the governor's line. So. Mr. Anders. Well, I mean, let's start with the baseline that I think income tax and most taxes are nothing more than armed theft. Or if you don't give the government <laughs> know, the money know, you earn, <laughs> they will show up with men and guns and put you in a cage. Okay? Um, and, yeah, it's a political football. They're playing around with our money. Um, I would like to see the income tax go to zero. Okay? I mean, if, if there's tax money. favor more of the House's plan. Though. Yeah. I, I right. want zero. Do, but do you get anything by the end of this session is the question. Oh, no. Uh, more. No. They're, Alonzo? they're all posturing for power. You get anything by the end of this session, Alonzo? Ugh. Any tax cut legislation passed? You know, I, I truly believe that, um, you know, West Virginians will not be happy. And I think there's, there's a lot of people that, you know, um, are going to be challenged in their primaries if nothing is to pass this, uh, this session. I, I do believe that the House plan um, will eventually, you know, walk through the, the, the finish line at the end of this. The Especially House, now instead that instead of the Senate plan? Instead of the Senate plan. I do believe that the House plan will, will walk across the finish line, mainly because the governor, I believe, is still going to um, support it. I think that now he has the actual Senate plan in front of him to where um, they can pick it apart. You know, before it was just, oh, the Senate saying that they were going to come with a plan. There was a plan, you know, out there. And um, once they dreamed it up, it was going to, uh, you know, be something that they could take a look at. Um, now, with the presentation of their plan, they walked back on the 50% reduction on PIT and um, in exchange went for you know something that was so demonstrably different from what they initially said. This is what they'll support to get across the finish line. So I, I, I do believe that at the end of this session, the Senate will come to its senses, and I think that they will pass this House plan. Larry, do you get tax relief by the end of this session or not? I don't think so. I think they're going to 
kick it back and forth, and then there'll be a special session, <laughs> and then nothing. Uh, Joe? And, and they'll talk about it for another year. Final word is yours, Joe. Yeah, I agree. I, we smelled this fish before, uh, and I think it was last year where the, the House wanted to cut income taxes, the Senate wanted to deal with property taxes. So we're right back where we started. Uh, I don't think they're going to get it done in 60 days. I think we're going to see a special session, and I think we're going to see the governor play facilitator to try to get something done in special session. And that's the final word, Joe. And on the clock with issue number two from the law offices of Burke Schultz, Harmon and Jenkinson, Larry Schultz. Yes, uh, the State of the Union address, uh, a political win for Joe Biden, especially after fakers like Senator Lee of Utah and former Senator Rick Scott of Florida lied about having never called for abolishing Social Security and Medicare. Um, did did Joe win uh, that, that sort of setup? A lot of Republicans seem to be very much opposed to canceling Social Security and Medicare in that public arena where he called them out about it. And so they, 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 uh, they're they a little angry that he lied about them. Um, does he win that? No, because I think... Well, Go ahead, Alonzo. Well, no, I think that people <laughs> see the, the discrepancies um, from the front. This was not the Republican plan to sunset Medicare. That was a Rick Scott plan. And what's not being talked about is you know, Joe Biden's position on this very same issue. You know, there's uh, a, a video from him in 1975 wanting to sunset Medicare, wanting to sunset Social Security, wanting to sunset uh, veterans benefits. And that's not going to get any press because, you know, it's not a part of the prevailing vision. But this is something that he advocated well, for. Fox News doesn't have it. And they, they're they afraid to show it if they do. It's there. I've it, seen it. It's okay. there. It's there. Uh -huh. Yeah. It, and, and the thing is, is that, you know, uh, a lot of these issues, you know, we, we are seeing, you know, how Social Security and Medicare is the third rail of politics, right? Nobody wants to touch it. And uh, it's just sad to see, uh, you know, the Republican position be maligned and to watch, you know, these blatant uh, exaggerations and, and just uh, misconceptions about uh, what it means to be a Republican in this country coming from the president of the United States. So it was supposed to be some great uniter that just sat there and spent, you know, his entire hour plus, you know, um, just railing against the other side. And sure, you could say it was a win uh, that, you know, uh, um, he got them to publicly state that they're not going to touch it. But uh, other than that, I, I did not find the State of the Union to be a, a win for Joe Biden. And I, I don't know. I just. Mr. Uh, Mr. Valente. So I, I think what if you went into the uh, State of the Union as a, a supporter of the president, you came out as a supporter of the president, the re Republicans, if you support the Repo Republicans, you'd re support the Repo Republicans afterwards. It's the mission. It's the middle that you're you're fighting for. And I think the optics of the uh, State of the Union, the you know, once again, Republicans screaming at the president during the State of the Union pre uh, 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 address and in their, him, in their defense that was because they, they they wanted to make sure he could hear them i'm sure uh <laughs> but and, and i don't have a problem with that because i'm a big fan of like the the british uh question parliamentary time, system uh, yeah the car, question time of the prime minister and they're jeering the prime minister the entire time i have no problem with that i think it's the way that biden handled that even if i disagree with him fundamentally on on most of his premises um, I think it was a master class on how to deal with a hostile crowd and make himself look actually presidential and not kind of this bumbling fool that a lot of people have uh, had of him going into that, that address. Um, again, stylistically, I think it was master class. Substantively, I'm not so convinced that it was uh, a fantastic speech. But, um, you know, that's, that's where I'm at with the, the State of the Union. Mr. Anders. No. Oh, okay, my turn. Well, I'll start off by saying I haven't watched a State of the Union address since my parent, my grandparents stopped forcing me to. Okay, I realize it's political theater. I realize what, what age was that, by the way? I think probably around 12. 
I, th- I was hoping you were going to say like 35. Or yeah. But, yeah. <laughs> It was last week. Um, no, but, um, you know, it's, it was all political theater again. You know, you have Biden and, and, and he's arguing because he's trying to gin up his donors and his voters. And you have the Republicans doing the same thing. It, they're all speaking to their bases. Now, I, I will say that, you know, Senator Lee is one of the two senators worth having in the United States Senate, in my humble opinion. Because? Because he is one of the truly more constitutional of, of, of those in the Senate. Uh, he and uh, Rand Paul. OK, um, outside of that, um, you know, good luck, um, especially Capito. She's basically ought to be a Democrat. But um, but I but I veered off. I think if you were looking to support the president, you found reasons to. And if you were looking to donate to the president, you found reasons to. If you were looking not to and donate to Republicans, you found reasons to. It's all political theater, no different than what we're seeing in Charleston. They're all just fighting over donations and power. Um, but, you know, the fact is, you know, one thing I haven't addressed yet is why is the government involved in Social Security and welfare? OK, government. There should be. Uh, I'm a student of Bastiat who wrote the law back in the 1840s. And the fact government should be not involved, not involved in any corporate welfare which goes back to the form energy or individual welfare, because that's taking money from one individual and giving it to another who did not earn it. OK, and, you know, it, 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 why is it OK for government to do so? Where if I went and said, you know, I think my sister needs a new pair of shoes and I pull out my gun and I hold it against Alonzo's head and I say, give me your money. It's illegal for me to do so. Why are we letting the government get away with it? Torts. Well, I, I'm going to go back to the comments uh, that Alonzo made, uh, bringing up a 50 year old quote from the president on Medicare when when Medicare was nine years old. Medicare is now 59 years old. And it was just last summer that the chairman of the National Republic Senatorial Committee, Rick Scott, produced a pamphlet which advocated sunsetting every federal law every five years. And then we his idea was that we would keep those federal laws and programs that we thought were worthy. And of course, that would include Social Security and Medicare. So. I thought President Biden was very careful in his comments to say that some Republicans have advocated for that. But what we learned in the State of the Union, which, by the way, I hate, uh, George Washington walked over to Congress his State of the Union speech and handed it in and left. Uh, Wouldn't be bad if we returned to those days rather than the political theater that we have now. But that being said, I, I, I think that President Biden has learned that there is a wing in the Republican Party that he can bait, that he can dare to speak up because they're going to show their behinds every time and they're going to be his foil. So as he campaigns for his uh, his reelection in the next two years, I think you're going to see this consistently from him, that he's going to bait these folks to yelling and screaming and running to the press and uttering their nonsense. And Republicans like Mitch McConnell and and Mitt Romney and others are going to be there just biting their tongue because they know that's not the way forward for the Republican Party. And my hope would be that those latter Republicans I mentioned would eventually take the reins and, and run the party the way we hope it should be run. Okay, so what you're saying is you support the Mitt Romneys and, and, and the Rick Scotts and, and, and those individuals, essentially the ones that have like sold out principle time and time again. Is that is that what you're saying? Because personally, you know, the, the, I find, you know, working in politics, I spend more time fighting the establishment sellout wing of the Republican Party, the left wing of the Republican Party, more than I do the Democrats. Well, I, no, I, I, Chris, I, I, uh, I long for a return to the Republican Party that I, that I grew up with, which was one that uh, uh, advanced interest of, 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 you know, personal responsibility, self-interest, and, and uh, in, in the business of America and, and supporting that. Uh, this Republican Party has off the rails in terms of what they want to fight for. And they want to have this cultural war, which I don't think advances the ball forward in America. Well, I mean, I think you can blame a lot of that on George W. Bush because I'm no Bush fan. 
okay, and Bush, everything from uh, the Patriot Act, which was the destruction of the Fourth Amendment, to, you know, no child left untouched, I mean, behind, okay, which is this huge government takeover of education, right? It was, uh, I, I see that smile, Rob. You know, you know I mean, that, that was like, here. you know, it was just like, you know, they, they kept saying, you know, uh, like, during, during the Clinton years, you know, it wasn't that Newt Gingrich was fighting for small government. He just convinced the Republicans they can get you know, stuff from big government, too. So we've had this major shift from the 90s and the 2000s from the base of the Republican Party, which is the protection of individual life, individual liberty, and private property rights, okay? We've got to get back the Republican Party back to its roots. What you're seeing right now is more or less a uniparty. People keep saying we need a third party. I'd like to have two for once. Larry, final word comes back to you. Uh, yeah, the, the Republican Party's roots um, were somewhere other than trying to overthrow a, fear, uh, a free and fair election. And that's the problem. If you need to get back to those roots, you need to look at rooting out the people who still cheer it and refuse to speak ill of those who let it. Um, having said all that, Mike Lee, 2010, when he first was running for the Senate, said, if I can't, if we can't rip these Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid out by the roots, there's no point in me being in the Senate. There's no point in me running. That's what I'm running for. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, um, he can say what his reasons are. I don't think a majority of Americans of any age are necessarily going to ever support that um, idea that in your old age, you're on your own. Well, let the free market take care of you. Um, I, I just don't think any group is going to ever go with that. God, I know you can't let Larry have the final word on that, Chris. <laughs> I know, I'm chomping at the bit here. No, it's not the government's job to be the nanny state. It's not the government's job to take care of you, okay? If you privatize Social Security, not just got rid of it, but just privatize and let people manage it themselves, that's fine. That's an IRA. OK, but saying that, you know, it's already bankrupt. It's a Ponzi scheme. It's a mess. OK, we can't afford to pay. You know, we keep going with what, 30 trillion dollars in debt. And if you take the welfare and the warfare and you put that together, we're a real mess. OK, and there's an unholy alliance between the left and the right where the left never, you know, they say they're against warfare, but they always spend on defense spending. Then you have the unholy alliance over on the right where they say, well, we're against these entitlements, but we'll let you spend it. Right. So what happens? Government grows you know the establishment wings of both parties have led to the horrible debt that we have today that we're papering over from the federal reserve which has caused inflation and i don't think they're done yet i think they're essentially trying to bankrupt this country this country if a majority of republicans believe that then the next time you control both houses and the white house all you have to do is prove your prove your beliefs by stopping every penny of corporate subsidies that are handed out in this country. I'd absolutely you stop them that. for 10 years, mm -hmm. you'd see an improvement in the debt, and you would have proved that this is what you actually believed rather than saying it and never doing it, right. which is but what, what the if Republicans was, do what, not. What if they got the gun and said, okay, we'll cut all corporate welfare, we'll cut all individual welfare then, okay? Was that something the Democrats would be willing to give on? Because honestly, I think they both ought to go away. And let's say, okay, we're, we're not going to do it right away, we're going to phase it over 10 years. Because people well, who have been you know, living their whole life and expecting this to be there when they retire, you can't just yank the rug out from underneath them, but I think you ought to privatize it and then phase it out over 10 years. At the same time, you know, it, this is what government should do if they really meant what they said but they don't mean what they say they're going for votes and donations and the people need to see i don't think it. we're ready to move I, on yet so david go ahead. Yeah, no, I'm, I, I'm cheering a lot of the stuff that you're saying because uh yeah government is doing way too much you know you're never going to get the uh the power out of government until you get the money out of government and so i mean the, reducing the amount of grift that people can pull out of the government is is going to be key for us to building a stable and a sustainable government um but you know i look at this from a perspective a political perspective as well that if you say we're going to yank the rug out from underneath uh, you know the the single moms and the you know the 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 people that are are struggling. You're never going to get buy-in on that. I mean, that, there, there's a reason why almost every liberal democracy has a welfare state with it. And how do you 
deconstruct it. You can't, I, tr- to me, you can't, there, there's no button to flip and say, we're going to cut you off tomorrow. You have to do it some, some way in a phased approach. Well, yeah, you'd would, have to yeah. do a phased approach. You'd have to phase it out. But but again, the, but we're the, not a democracy. But the, we're but a the, republic. The it's end democracy. of that yeah. equation, though, is, Chris, that no matter how well you set up anything, there's always going to be a percentage of people who do not, for whatever reason, take care of themselves. It could be bad luck. It could be bad health. It right. could be a bad economy. But for whatever the reason, it doesn't work out in the end cash-wise. So how do we pay for those people? Well, that's simple. Who it's pays the way for we them? always did it do back we just, before 1913. Do they just, do they just okay. die in the street? Or, do we, do, or no. what, what do we do with them? No, I mean, before 1913, we had no federal income tax. Federal income tax was unconstitutional. They fought for that so they could build these programs, consolidate power in Washington, D.C. What you do is by slowly phasing that out. You know, I'm not, re- first of all, you have to go with the understanding. I'm not responsible for someone else's bad decisions. Correct. Okay, we've got to stop there. Okay, secondly... Uh, prior but, to but having you all could, these taxes, but, but you, you could had suffer churches. the repercussions of their bad decisions if there's enough of them around you. Not not necessarily. What I'm saying is churches, charities, private organizations. Okay, if we stop taking forty percent of what people made, you know, out of their paycheck, and allow them to fund choices, that that's the advantage of being a more volunteer society, where government isn't taking your money from you, and then politicians fight over to get votes and more donations for their political campaigns. If we, if we reduced, in fact, I think if, I still believe that if the founding fathers believe in a federal income tax, we would have had it from the beginning. We don't need it. We don't want it. We need to get rid of it. Prior to 1913, we fought and won eight wars. We had roads, we had hospitals, everything else. But it was all part of Woodrow Wilson's plan to make the world safe for democracy. We're not even a democracy, like I've said a million times. We're a constitutional republic. And he wanted to make the bankers happy but creating the Federal Reserve. So how do you do that? You have to phase in an income tax. You create the Federal Reserve. And, oh, by the way, we're going to gut the republic by passing the 17th Amendment and have the direct election of senators. 17th Amendment needs to be repealed, too, because the sev- the Senate is supposed to be the state's house and the House is a people's house. And that's the way it needs to return. And, and on that, we transition to you for issue number three, <laughs> by the way. Oh, boy. Now I'm fired up. OK, let's talk about the unconstitutional Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms and Explosives. Right. Um, we have it, some employees it, listening. Oh, good. By the way. Well, um, well, they work for an unconstitutional agency. <laughs> um, the thing is, they came out about a week or so ago, maybe three weeks ago. I know the ATF makes in runs around Congress and creates law out of thin air by writing rules. Recently, they came out with the new thing saying if you have an arm brace on your AR pistol, even though we've said for decades it's okay, now, you know, because we want to get some points for the Biden administration, you know, with the anti gun radical. We're going to say if you don't register your gun with us in 120 days, which, you know, registration list or confiscation list, uh, you will be a federal criminal. Now, I'm sitting and I'm watching around the country because gun rights is something I work on a lot. And a lot of states and counties are starting to stand up and say, you can't do this here. What I find extremely depressing is that the state of West Virginia with a huge Republican majority, supposedly loved the Second Amendment, has never put, in, has not yet put in legislation to number one, tell the ATF you cannot enforce this law here, and we will stop you. Uh, and secondly, start to threaten the fact that they have an allocation here. I mean, why are we allowing this unconstitutional agency to continue to be here? I mean, we've got to put our money where our mouth is. You watch states like Kentucky. Kentucky is putting through nullification bills that says if our st- there's three levels of nullification which is making these rules illegal uh, within the state. And you have the first one, which they pass a resolution. They all say, well, you can't do it here, but there's no teeth behind it. Nothing happens, okay? That's worthless. That's so politicians can go out and campaign and raise money. Typical political theater. Second is like Kentucky is doing. What Kentucky has done is you cannot enforce this here. And if you do, we will, you, our law enforcement is not allowed to help you or we, they will be arrested if they help you. And finally, is the way it ought to be done, according to James Madison and Thomas Jefferson, is that way you pass the ATF, you did not, that was in run around Congress. Your Article 1, Section 8 says only Congress can make laws. So if you try to enforce this here, we will arrest and detain and charged with a crime to extend beyond one year and one day, making it a felony, any federal agent, contractor, or employee that attempts to, you know, enforce on the people. And I'm just stunned that nobody has the guts in West Virginia to put in a bill like that. Mr. Ferretti, I'll go to you. 
Well, I understand that uh, our Attorney General, uh, Pat Morrissey, has joined other Attorney Generals across the country. I think there's 21 who are Republicans and who typically file lawsuits against the Biden administration. I believe they've got a lawsuit pending on this very issue. And, Chris, I think that the fate of this ban on this bracing mechanism for these pistols uh, will be the same as it was when the Trump administration attempted to have uh, a rule enforced about bump stocks, uh, which I believe lost in the courts uh, based on the uh, usurpation of of congressional authority. So I I think this will suffer the same fate. So I, I would rest easy on that. I think the law is going to be probably on your side in terms of uh, the ATF trying to ban these braces. But let's understand that that, that the rationale behind this, uh, I think, was because there were uh, recent mass shootings where these AR pistols with a bracing mechanism are easy to conceal on one's person. So they can enter a mall or a shopping center, or I believe uh, one was used in a grocery store shooting. They can conceal that quickly put it together, and then start firing off rounds very effectively using a short barrel uh, weapon. And and so I think that was the rationale. But legally, I think the uh, ban will suffer the same fate as bump stocks. I mean, I I don't want to sit around and wait for judges. Hold hold for the end. Right, we got to get through the the rest of the panel first, too. Larry? Um, Yeah, this um, is way out there, it seems to me. Um, we've heard a lot today about what government is uh, required to do and what they're not required to do. Um, it's always struck me that government at all levels has a responsibility for the safety of the American people. So, for example, we have rules about whether you can have a car, um, a stock automobile, that goes 600 miles an hour uh, produced by Ford for people to buy and drive in a place where the speed limit's never above 70. Um, There are rules that are designed for safety. Um, This is another rule that's designed, as Joe talks about, for safety. They may have, Joe and and you may both be right, uh, in a court fight, they may lose. And there, it may be just one more piece of ignoring the um, unbelievable number of mass shootings that we're now having on a monthly basis uh, in this country. It's another means of ignoring that so that, um, let's just say, um, uh, it, some insecure folks can show off their AR in the Walmart. Um, I I wish that didn't have to be a part of our culture, but I'm darn sure not going to be going to Walmart if I think there's too many armed people wandering around. Um, Guns have a tendency to be used um, more often than they should to resolve disputes. And if you have a gun in your hand, and so does the other guy, It's kind of hard to think, what am I doing with this thing if it's not to resolve disputes? Um, We've got way too many guns. It's just way too uh, expanded. So I cheer on the ATF. I hope uh, Kentucky uh, is prepared to do what they say they're going to do Mm -hmm. and fill their prisons uh, with federal employees because that will be interesting to watch as well. Mr. Valente. All right, so um, the reason why we're not getting anybody in West Virginia doing it is we are way too reliant on federal money. So if you yeah. if you cut an agency out, uh, the federal government can just say, well, we'll just start withholding money payments to West Virginia. All of a sudden, our taxes and uh, you know all these things that we've been talking about today dry up. Uh, so that's part of the reason why we haven't seen any movement on this. Um, you, you might see some movement on maybe sanctuary, sanctuary cities, that, that type of thing. But, uh, yeah, I, I just don't expect the, the West Virginia government to take up this issue uh, in, in, uh, for an accessory on, on weapons. Um, maybe if it was actual weaponry, the, the actual weapon itself, then maybe we'd see some movement. But I, I just don't see it happening. But 
I will say to your point, I, I, you know, the police have no duty to assist you, to protect you. If you are in a situation where you are in danger, even if a police officer is five feet from you and a person pulls out a gun and is intending to shoot you or pulls out a knife and is intending to harm you, they have no duty to intervene. So you need to be able to protect yourself. Now, I do I think we go overboard? Absolutely. And I, I think sometimes people within the government community are its worst advocates because they, they go overboard on on it. But I also know that because of the, the you know, federal government wanting to encroach on that right uh, is part of the reason why. Because, you know, every time Joe Biden or Barack Obama or, or even Donald Trump does something for guns, what is the what is the next logical reaction? People run to the gun store and buy, you know, metric crap tons of guns. Mm-hmm. So you know, appreciate the self editing there. I appreciate that. <laughs> but yeah, that's I mean that's that's the the, the problem here is that we we continue fi- feed into this fear loop that that you know government's going to take our guns, so we buy more guns. Uh, government regulates this stuff, and I, we can all we could do a. a entire show on regulatory law writing that that you know regulatory agencies are are writing laws uh that impact us every day mm-hmm. um we just don't have the advocacy of, of second amendment groups on a lot of this stuff mr perry so uh, there's a lot to to cover here and really you know uh, i think what we need to talk about is uh the administrative state's role in, you know, this lawmaking progress. You know, uh, most most of this issue is not necessarily talking about, you know, uh, what decisions are being made. I don't don't think that anybody, you know, is really concerned about that. But what we should be concerned about is, you know, who are we giving the authority to make these decisions to? You know, the ATF should not be able to, you know, we don't vote for them. They shouldn't be able to create laws. They shouldn't be able to, you know, be judge, jury, and executioner in uh, policymaking. And I think that this pistol brace thing is just a, a, a showing of the administrative of state uh, usurping power that it shouldn't have. And that's that's really, you know, concretely what we're talking about. Um, as for, you know, this being a measure of safety and everything, I mean, this is just a ridiculous notion. You know, uh, it, when we talk about gun violence and stuff, you know, we, we spoke, I think it was, you know, last week about uh, mass shootings and, and different issues with that. And the sources that were brought up or whatever are disparaging. When you go and actually look at the, the uh, the, the statistics that are being cited by CNN and all of these groups that say, oh, you know, what qualifies a mass shooting is just four people being a casualty or whatnot. When you go deeper into that, I saw in their statistics there was uh, a, a, a burglary. There was like a house, you know, someone's house got uh, raided and there was four people shot. There was a drive-by shooting in the statistics. There was a, a whole bunch of criminal uh, activity that is actually being taken care of. And that's why we need to focus more on the criminal element in society and not this issue of guns. It doesn't matter what type of guns are on the street. If you want to commit an egregious crime, you're going to commit an egregious crime. And what we need to do is focus on uh, how we can prevent crime through, you know, uh, empowering law enforcement and not deconstructing their capabilities. Now, as for nullifying federal agencies, a lot of them, they shouldn't have been created in the first place. And uh, I think the ATF should be a, a convenience store and not a, uh, a government agency. And that's where I'll leave it. Mr. That's Anders, a, you get a, final a, word, but you only get 30 seconds to 30 express seconds. it. 30 seconds, okay. Way over schedule. In order, security is never a replacement for liberty. We do not wait for robed overlords to save us, right? It, in 1798, Madison and Jefferson, they might have known something about the Constitution, wrote the Virginia and Kentucky resolutions that said it is the duty of state legislators to interpose themselves between federal tyranny and the people. And I'm really surprised and disappointed that they haven't. This is how far we've come from the freedom we had. All right, very good. I appreciate you abiding by the 30-second rule. I didn't have a stopwatch on you, but it felt right. It felt good. (laughs) (laughs) Now, to issue number four and David Valente. Hey, so um, uh, next weekend is uh, President's Day weekend, so it's a long weekend. Uh, and you may not have heard a whole lot about this uh, rally that's going to be happening in Washington, D.C. It is couched as an anti-war rally. It's called the Rage Against the War Machine Rally. Um, it was, it's being sponsored by my former political party, the Libertarian Party, 
and a group called the People's Party and a few other uh, sponsors, Code Pink, are uh, involved as well. Um, I will start by saying that it's possible to not like what the United States is doing with regards to Ukraine, uh, but also holding Russia to account for its invasion of Ukraine. Um, this is not really so much an anti-war party or war rally as it is really a pro-Putin apologia party. And uh, a lot of the statements of the speakers that are that are coming on, I'll give you a rundown of, of some of the speakers. Um, a guy named Caleb Maupin, who's a correspondent for RT. The People's Party, which is actually a very far-left uh, Marxist party, which is an interesting juxtaposition with the Libertarian Party of the United States. Uh, Garland Nixon, uh, RT correspondent, Sputnik, Sputnik News as well. Daniel McAdams, who is the Ron Paul Institute uh, head. Uh, Ron Paul himself. Jackson Hinkle, who uh, sells Z merch. So if you have been watching war coverage, you know that the Russian equipment is marked with this Z symbol. So um, uh, Tara Reid, who uh, is mo most famous for accusing Joe Biden of sexual assault when he was in the Senate in the 90s. Um, uh, but she is a, a Putin apologist. Jimmy Dore, a comedian who is also uh, towing the uh, towing the Putin line, the Ru pro Russia line. Um, most of these uh, supporters are talking about, you know, rather than anti war, pro peace rally, they're saying that we need to get out so that Russia can do what it needs to do to, to take over Ukraine or at least take over the Donbass and the Crimea and, and solidify its. Uh, holding of that. Uh, the one speaker that has really drawn most of the ire of this is a guy named Scott Ritter. And if you remember Scott Ritter, he was a UN weapons inspector, inspector during the first run up to the second Gulf War um, and said that Saddam didn't have weapons. He, he went off on, you know, the, the Bush administration about the, the build up to the to the second Gulf War. Um, at that same time, he was also being charged with uh, preying on teenagers. Um, in 2002, he was uh, put in jail for, for a period of time for preying on a 15-year-old. And in uh, 20, I think 2012, he was actually convicted fully of preying and exposing himself to a police officer who was posing as a 12-year-old or 15-year-old in, in a chat. And uh, so he was convicted, spent some time in jail. Um, I, I weep for the people that are still within the Libertarian Party um, that aren't really aware of what's going on with the, the National Committee at this point because um, this to, to be in a war is one thing. To, to, to have an anti-war rally or at least anti-U.S. support of what's going on in Ukraine, um, that's one thing. But to turn it into this kind of clown show of people – towing pro-Putin lines and, to, and you know, putting this guy as one of your main speakers, Scott Ritter, I think it's just been a big disservice to, to the Libertarian Party. And we're starting to see, you know, uh, not only the hemorrhaging of, of membership from the Libertarian Party, but, you know, also mon money from the Libertarian Party. Um, there, there's lots of risks that go into this, uh, this rally that they're having uh, with such disparate groups involved. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I just think that at this point, you know, a lot of the rank and file libertarians have no idea of what's going on nationally uh, with it, with their party. But this is stuff that's going on in their name. And, uh, you know, there's a good chance that there could be some violence at this rally just because of the di disparate groups that you have involved. And uh, I don't think that the process that they put in pr place to start this rally has enough insurance to keep the party from being drug into the courts if something bad happens. What so, is your question for the group to consider? So my question for the group to consider is it, what is your thoughts on uh, this anti-war rally and whether it is a pro-Putin rally, whether it is, uh, what your thoughts are on the anti-war move? It should it be aligned with uh, Ru Russian interest or should it be really just anti-war and anti-government giving money to the all right. Uh, because of time constraints, everybody is capped at uh, a minute on this one. So, Alonzo, you go first. Oof, only a minute. Okay. Well, uh, you know, I I don't think that, like, I, I don't support the Ukraine war. I, I don't think that, you know, this was a smart decision. I think that this is a uh, 
pretty gross expansion of the liberal international order. I think that, you know, if uh, Canada and Mexico were creating a democratic security regime with China or whatnot, we would expect our president to do something. And I think that that's what's happened in Russia. I think that, uh, you know, NATO surrounded uh, Putin, and I believe that, you know, um, it doesn't make me an apologist that I don't support this war. Lastly, I would just like to say that uh, I support the Henry Kissinger plan that says that we give the Donbass and the Luhansk, I I'm butchering those names, but those regions to Russia or whatever in order to mitigate a treaty with this war. And I think that us just, you know, throwing kindling to the fire is a, a disaster for America and um, it's hurt the world order as well. Mr. Anders. Okay, first of all, I know Ron Paul. I work for Ron Paul. Ron Paul is not a Russian apologist, okay? He is true to his roots, which is the old Republican conservative stance, which is non-intervention in foreign affairs, okay? George Washington said it, Article 1, Section 8, only Congress can declare war. We haven't been in a legally declared war since World War II, okay? Um, so do I think we ought to be interfering? No. I don't think we ought to be interfering. I think, you know, getting foreign entanglements. In fact, we still have 900 bases in over 100 countries worldwide. We need to bring those troops home. Constitutionally, they belong here. Put them on our border rather than worrying about the border between Ukraine and Russia. Mr. Schultz. Yeah, I mean, uh, we could bring those troops home and make them um, um, guards in West Virginia's prisons and jails. <laughs> Oh, uh, you're, 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 that was a good one. You're dropping mics left and right on air and off air. Wow. Uh, so uh, I just think that when you look at the bravery of the Ukrainian people, that they are fighting for their homeland, that this attack didn't take place in Donbass or those other places. It was in Ukrainian cities that should still be a part of Ukraine when this is all over. If we do not stand up now then we will have to stand up later. We did this with Hitler. We said, okay, well, you know, it's just those little countries right around them and Poland and stuff. And then all of a sudden, we had him to fight worldwide and the Japanese too. It's, it's smart. Don't forget the Italians, Larry. Well, that's a good point. There, um, it's smart to say, oh no, we're not gonna sit in the way of this and wait until the gun is pointed at us. We're going to help them go ahead and stop the Russians now, which, by the way, they're doing a pretty good job. And do you, Mr. Ferretti? Well, uh, to David's point about the Libertarian Party, I, I think this anti-war movement is just an indication that there's actually a war within the party itself. Uh, we're well, far removed from the days of Gary Johnson getting the most votes of any Libertarian candidate for president in 2016 uh, to now where there's just, uh, uh, you know, battle after battle being fought for the soul of the Libertarian Party. And they seem to have been taken over by some of these far right wing elements who who are uh, pro Putin. And, and that's the distinction I would make. It's not that they don't want to intervene in foreign affairs. They are actually pro Putin and support his invasion of Ukraine and would further support his invasion of Estonia, Latvia and those and those countries to the far north because they were once part of the Russian Empire, too. That is something that we cannot condone. And, and I, I, I think our efforts to, to stop Putin's expansionist policies are, are right on. Now, I will run out of time for Alonzo's final point if I entertain more discussion on this. So, David, I'll give you 30 seconds for the final word. Yeah, I mean, uh, the point I would make to you on Mexico and Canada, we wouldn't, we're not talking about invading Quebec or, uh, you know, California del Sur. We're, we're you know, if they got into an alliance, we'd put pressure on them, but we wouldn't be invading them over that. Um, but, uh, you know, the, yeah, you're, ta you're right, Joe. It is a war within the Libertarian Party, and the, the war is being lost because people are just walking away because it's a volunteer thing. You know, there are places to go, and like I did, I walked away. A lot of people were starting to walk away. All right, Alonzo, issue number five. We've got five total minutes for a discussion on, in, in wrapping it up. Okay, well, I'll make it quick. Um, so I want to return to Biden's State of the Union address. And um, it briefly covered police misconduct in the Tyree Nichols case. Uh, but why did he still decide to make it about race, even when that situation had black officers? And that's my question to the group. All right, uh, I'll go to you first via telephone, Joe. How did he make it about race? Well, uh, I thought he, he mentioned that it was an opportunity to uh, enhance 
police training and and uh, and was supportive of of further uh, efforts to hire good cops. Uh, I didn't see him or hear him make it about race. I think when he was mentioning, you know, the talk as if it was some kind of uh, secret black covenant between families that, you know, they're the only ones that have to educate their kids about, uh, you know, an interaction with police. Uh, I believe that he made it about race by, you know, just uh, kind of going on the same tropes of a manipula. Uh, uh, emotional manipulation of black people by, you know, um, telling them that they're going to be unsafe at traffic stops and that they have to worry about their kids, you know, going out on the road as if that's not a concern that every parent has. Uh, why, why did he have to, you know, make it about race instead of, like you said, uh, just about police uh, activity whatsoever and what we can do to help law enforcement? I, I'm sorry, I didn't hear that in the State of Union. I might have missed it, but I, I thought the focus was on training and, and hiring. Larry Schultz. Um, yeah, the the reason uh, he uh, spoke about this is because even though the race of the cops was different than it usually is, the race of the victim wasn't. And when I, uh, if if I were a person of color uh, talking to my teenage son, I wouldn't be worried about the race of the cops who were coming to jerk him out of his car and beat him up. I'd be worried about his race because. It happens to black youth more than it does to white youth. It simply does. And so those parents have a burden on them that I never really felt living in Berkeley Springs as a white guy. Um, and I think it's a good point to make that allows, uh, I mean, the cops were a different race, but that's not the issue. The victim was the same race it usually is. And the same race as George Floyd, the same race as some of the uh, other folks who've been unarmed and killed. Um, and so we have a long ways to go with this. It, um, I, I do believe that the Memphis Police Department jumped on this very quickly, and they're to be saluted for that. They didn't jump on it quick enough, uh, obviously, or it wouldn't have happened. Mr. Valente. Yeah, I mean, there's there's a whole lot of things that you know. With, with Biden, I would say that it's more. He was more talking about uh, again police reforms, police getting uh, reforms in the community um, because it's not a race, totally a race issue, uh, except for the victims. It really is a systemic issue of what's going on in policing that you could tell by that video that there was a complete lack of training of those officers, even in just the use of their their equipment. And so uh, no, nobody could articulate what the guy was being pulled over for. Like there, there was just so much going wrong with that, that it spoke to a lack of training within the police department. And I think that's one of the things that, that Biden is right to, to speak on. Mr. Anders. Okay, well, that, I'm going to start off with that. Identity politics and racism is the ugliest form of collectivism where people are judged by physical characteristics they have no control over rather than the content of the character. But again, groups don't have rights. Your rights come individual. They come from your creator. Everybody should be and must be treated equally. And, 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 and you know, again, um, you know, we do have a problem. We do have with the failed war on drugs. Now we have the militarization of the police state, okay? Um, and we do need to address, I think, body cams everywhere. You know, there ought to be a lot of criminal justice reform. But I want to address something real quick. You know, the Hitler straw man has always brought up why we need to interfere, you know, internationally. That's a straw man. Hitler is a byproduct of our adventurism in foreign, uh, in foreign affairs. Because if we had never got involved in World War I and destroyed the German, you know, it helped the Allies destroy Germany like they did, the madman like Hitler would have never risen to power. Now, Alonzo, it comes back to you for the final word. Yeah, so um, I, I want to just quickly point out that, you know, uh, this isn't a, a racial issue. And then to point out that, oh, you know, this happens to black people more often is just, I mean, statistically not even true, you know. Um, this is a socioeconomic issue and uh, has to deal with people that are in poverty that are in heavily policed areas, just period, right? Uh, and not only that, but I disagree with Mr. Valente that this is a training problem. This isn't a training problem. Uh, no amount of training is going to stop evil people from being evil. Um, what this is is a personnel problem. And what we've seen over the past couple of years is the demonization of police, right, that is p causing good people to stay away from being law enforcement officers. Uh, I think if you have any sense, you're, you're almost terrified to be a, a law enforcement officer now. Ten and, seconds, Alonzo. And um, 
they have recruitment problems or tension problems and this will be used as an excuse to place more resources in the dismantling of law enforcement capabilities and that's all i got